Oh, okay, I, I think I will start the talk. Uh, yeah, to start the talk right now because I think we have enough people here. And yeah. So uh, hello everyone and uh, welcome to the Martinist Talk season three. And uh, today we, we are honored to have uh, Professor He from UCLA to share about bio-inspired uh, bio uh, intelligent hydrogels uh, with us. And uh, okay, without further ado, I will start you, sorry, I keep, yeah. Uh, I will start you first, uh, thank everyone for contributing to the talk and make it happen. And uh, thanks everyone for the great efforts and time. And today, uh, first I will start to introduce about our society and some other events of our society. And then uh, Dr. Lin will introduce uh, Professor Her and uh, start a talk. Uh, so the talk will last for around 45 to 50 minutes, and then they are uh, followed by uh, around 30 minutes QA sections, and uh, Dr. Lin will lead the QA sections, as well as uh, then Professor Ho will answer uh, our questions. So, uh, so a little bit introduction of our society. So the Mate Society uh, is a non-profit organization aimed to promote interdisciplinary exchange uh, between uh, young scholars and to promote uh, young scholars as well. And currently we have uh, several uh, events. Uh, the first one, Marketless Talk, which is the one today, uh, aims at sharing the academic research and frontier research. And we also have a WPA Talk, which aims to uh, share experience uh, from the world beyond academia to our PhD students and postdoc students and also young researchers. We also have like a PMS workshop, which aims to uh, help, help our young scholars to build our skill sets, uh, both useful in academia and the world out, outside of academia. And we, so for every season, we also have kind of special issue, uh, which will invite uh, speakers based on, our, based on our audience request and to share their successful experience and uh, share the, their life stories with us. So if you have any questions or interested in being a speaker or a host, uh, please visit, visit our website. And uh, you can also contact us through our email and uh, follow us on our WeChat and Twitter accounts. Now I will pass, uh, uh, I will pass to Dr. Lin, uh, who will introduce uh, uh, Professor Her. Yeah, no. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Zheng Yi. Thank you, Zheng Yi, and uh, all the other organizers for providing such a, a wonderful platform to bring us together. So uh, my name is Shao Tingli. I'm currently working as a post uh, associate in mechanical engineering at MIT. Today is my great honor to as a host uh, for uh, uh, hosting this today's talk by Professor Xi Min He. So Professor He is the assistant professor of material science engineering at UCLA and the faculty of California Nano Systems Institute. She was a postdoc research fellow in West Institute of Bioinspired Engineering and the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Harvard. Uh, she received the, his, uh, P, her PhD in chemistry from University of Cambridge. Her research mainly focused on bioinspired soft materials structural polymers and their physical, mechanical, electrical, and photothermal properties with broad applications in biomedicine, energy, environment, and robotics. Uh, Professor He has received numerous awards, to name a few, uh, MCF Career Award, uh, International Society of Bionic Engineering, Outstanding Youth Award, and, and uh, recently, the prestigious SES Young Investigator Medal Award. And her research on bi-inspired tough hydrogels, phototropic, phototoxic, hemostatic, and anti-icing materials have gained a number of regional and international awards and was featured in more than 100 international news outlets. So without further introduction, let's welcome Professor Shi Min He. So Professor He, uh, you, you, you probably can share your screen and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. That will replace the current screen. Okay. Okay, move back. 
All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Shouting, for the kind introduction. And thanks, uh, Jen and uh, Bing Bing and so many people um, having me here. Um, so I actually know this guy so for quite some time. And uh, it's really exciting to see how they have put uh, effort uh, during the past of a year or two uh, to establish such a wonderful platform. So it's truly my honor to uh, have the opportunity to share some of our research here uh, with, with you guys. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in material science engineering at UCLA. So uh, our lab is uh, focused on bio-inspired soft materials. So today I'm gonna be talking about bio-like structures with a bio-like intelligence. So uh, actually one of the um, most uh, amazing species uh, in the world that always uh, intrig like uh, looks very intriguing to me is uh, octopus and is known to be one of the uh, smartest uh, um, animals. Yeah, so here you can see it has a really all soft body except just one tiny piece of bone um, uh, near the mouth. The, uh, so it, as long as the, the, the environment or the passage is uh, bigger than the coin size uh, uh, big bone, uh, they're able to squeeze their body, reconfigure and change the shape to pass through. So it's really showing how amazing you know, having this all soft body is and then second thing is uh, uh, even though it's made of old like a soft tissue and it, but it's, it has a really forceful muscle uh, they're really tough and can generate a really high contractile force so they're soft but also very strong and and tough and uh, another amazing feature uniquely uh, for octopus is uh, they locate actually about two thirds of their neurons in their arms. Therefore, as you can see, even if their arms are chopped off, they're still able to individually interact interact with the world so they can sense the, uh, the local environment and the move uh, accordingly. Um, so this gave us a lot of inspiration of uh, designing some uh, uh, like materials with uh, all the sensing actuation abilities and also they're able to control and to like uh, um, with the feedback loop uh, locally to control their, their local motion. And uh, uh, so that I definitely uh, shows this uh, amazing advantage of this uh, special uh, sensory actuating system to be fully autonomous. And all these uh, uh, functions and uh, important features actually arise from this uh, very basic neuromuscular mechanism, which uh, uh, govern the uh, transduction of the energy from chemical to uh, like biological, to chemical to uh, mechanical energy, right? So it doesn't really involve very complex uh, computer programming or human intervention, right? So uh, they have all the you know, amazing material properties and also the intelligence uh, built in the system system that inspired a lot of our research. And besides uh, octopus, there are so many other species that are really interesting. And so they're able to adapt and move and transfer objects uh, in the form of a changing color, shape, volume, and uh, to realize the, uh, the basic functions of uh, simply moving them around to grow, to uh, clear the objects, or simply just uh, keeping them alive. Right, so uh, so many uh, interesting features and designs um, are worth uh, learning from, um, like for, for, for a human being. So if we look at the artificial world, we can see actually <clears throat> there are still a lot of challenges, still a lot of new features that we try to realize in man-made materials. For example, we uh, we wanted to make our material uh, to respond to respond to uh, more stimuli uh, to be uh, intelligence, so that they can be self-regulating, they can self-oscillate or self-heal uh, by using the very basic uh, type of energy conversion, like a chemomechanical modulation. <clears throat> So with those, we, we may envision that we may be able to have a more self-sustained implants so that we don't have to open the chest to replace the material because they are able to sustain some part of the bodily function by themselves, for example, uh, or they are able to generate autonomous motions for uh, the next generation of uh, uh, robotics, uh, or they, they can do this adaptive reconfiguration by themselves as well, right? So there are so many, um, <clears throat> interesting features that we may uh, achieve by learning from nature. Um, so with this, uh, in our lab, we basically identify the two major gaps between living materials and uh, uh, man-made materials. So they are uh, basically lifelike intelligence and also bio-like structures. Uh, 
So um, the bio-like intelligence basically refer to how we are able to build uh, logic or computing abilities within the material without external control. Uh, like we, we, we can see here, uh, our body is able to control the body, uh, the blood, uh, blood pressure uh, to maintain at a constant level. Similarly, our body temperature as well. And here uh, where our neuromuscular system is able to sense the environment and uh, uh, respond and generate motion accordingly. Right? So this all shows the ability to have uh, this beauty and fat loop, a feedback loop to realize this uh, continuous a, a process of a sensing, diagnose, and respond, right? So uh, we hope we're able to make a material approaching this kind of uh, autonomy and intelligence. And uh, uh, besides this kind of high level function, we identify there are still a lot of basic challenges like the, uh, the, the structure properties uh, at the structure property levels with the materials. So for example, uh, we know uh, wood has been really uh, like a um, interesting uh, like biomaterials that inspired a lot of research, right? So uh, like a Professor Liang Ming Hu's group. And uh, um, so you can see uh, that we're able to uh, take advantage of this hierarchical structures uh, to build like a tough materials or with the uh, aligned or anisotropic materials. And also Nacre, um, like some of our um, fellows who have, who have been uh, working on related tough materials, uh, Nacre has inspired a lot of uh, tough composite or like a, uh, like a um, ceramic materials uh, over the past uh, decades, right? But if we look at the soft materials, uh, we know in our body muscles or tendons are very um, like a uh, tough while being soft, right? So actually they have this a uh, very complex structure uh, uh, with the features at a uh, multiple length scales, right? So uh, for our like a polymer soft uh, materials lab, uh, we are really uh, intrigued by this kind of uh, soft and tough materials uh, to try to learn um, their like design to build uh, like some tough man-made materials. Yeah, so um, based on this identified, these two gaps between living and man-made materials, uh, our lab has been focused on uh, one um, model material uh, like uh, um, to develop these features in our lab. So this is the hydrogel. Uh, hydrogel is a class of uh, um, water-laden cross-linked polymer networks. So basically you have polymer chains and they are cross-linked. So these red dials represent the uh, cross-linking points. So these cross-linking uh, uh, points can be covalent bound or can be physical cross-linking. Uh, so there are several different ways of uh, cross-linking this polymer chains so that uh, it's not really fully deserved, uh, dissolved in water. So it's just a, uh, like a piece of gel because uh, um, like when you have this uh, polymer chain uh, being hydrophilic uh, polymer uh, materials, if you uh, so they like water. So if you uh, put it in in water, uh, this uh, um, hydrophilic polymer network will absorb water molecule inside of the network, so that the um, uh, the, the the this polymer network will be swollen by the uh, by the liquid or water uh, to um, have this kind of a combination of a liquid and solid. Um, uh, construction. Yeah, so with this kind of uh, um, material, uh, usually uh, they have uh, this kind of uh, appearance, so very soft and like a uh, uh, squishy, and uh, if you uh, zoom in, you're able to see typically they are highly porous, uh, so that uh, it's able to, you know, uh, serve as a tissue uh, scaffold, or like a, uh, like a wound healing materials or cosmetic materials, or like contact lens uh, is made of hydrogel, and uh, diapers because it's a highly water absorbent. And uh, um, but another uh, issue with hydrogel uh, besides all this attractive feature is uh, mechanically, typically it's a relatively weak because uh, this has a really like power structure. So you have a relatively low uh, solid fraction um, with uh, uh, almost 90% of the volume being occupied by water, this material is almost like a tofu. So it's a mechanically, typically uh, very fragile, uh, not strong enough. So for a lot of uh, uh, important practical uh, application, so uh, people have been trying to make them 
uh, to maintain all these uh, attractive features while uh, improving the mechanical strength or toughness. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about this part of effort uh, later today. Yeah, so basically hydrogel is our model materials in the lab. Um, and another important feature of hydrogel is we are able to design the polymer network to be responsive to multiple uh, stimuli, environmental stimuli. For example, they can respond to, oops, they can respond to, um, uh, respond to humidity. Uh, sorry, just keep going back and forth. Uh, respond to humidity. Uh, you can use uh, electrolyte polymer chains so that they can respond to pH, uh, or you can uh, design them to have a, a light sensitive moiety so uh, they can respond to uh, uh, light or temperature or uh, any molecule of interest. Right, so uh, basically, they can change their volume by uh, absorbing more water. Or they can, uh, uh, like when you alter the local environment condition, they can shrink by squeezing the water molecule out. And this kind of a volumetric change and other property change in response to different kinds of stimuli are typically reversible. Um, yeah, so this is another important feature that allows us to develop those kind of a, uh, like a intelligent uh, uh, features that I mentioned earlier. Right, so basically in our lab, uh, we work uh, all the way from the molecular level chemistry uh, to the, um, the synthesis to property and to functions to try to uh, develop or study the microscopic level of physical mechanical properties. Right, so with this introduction about hydrogels, uh, we can tell uh, gel is uh, such a unique uh, uh, material that uh, combines both liquid and solid uh, so that they have a, a really good biocompatibility with the similarity to our real tissue. Uh, so um, we have been uh, trying to use it as a tissue scaffold or serving as a, a nice soft human machine interface. Uh, and because of this uh, stimuli responsiveness behavior, uh, we try to use it as a material for or soft robotics, and uh, uh, with this kind of a softness and, and uh, functional uh, function uh, res functional re uh, functionalizability, uh, we also try to develop uh, uh, like a functional materials for uh, soft electronic devices. And also uh, recently we have been uh, trying to improve the mechanical property of the gel so that they can uh, do some load bearing job uh, with this uh, structural materials and also make sure they are uh, like a, um, compatible with the additive manufacturing like the 3D printing. So with this, in our lab, basically, uh, we uh, focus on three directions. So first is a focus on the, uh, the structure uh, of the material. So with this, uh, uh, like some new abilities of uh, uh, manipulating or uh, engineering uh, the micro nano structures of the gel, uh, we were able to uh, tailor or tune or improve the mechanical properties of the gel so that they can be really tough or they can be really as soft as brain tissue. And also they can be still uh, 3D printable into like meta materials. And uh, uh, usually uh, we try to make sure the uh, synthesis or fabrication method are scalable uh, so that you can make, make a large sized uh, materials. And second thing is a focus on this uh, stimuli responsive volume changing with this kind of a, uh, like a smart feature. Uh, we have uh, uh, been developing different types of uh, soft robotics materials and also this intelligent uh, light tracking materials for energy harvesting and also this kind of 4D printing uh, and as well as the uh, chemical biological sensing. Uh, based on the this uh, um, like a stimuli responsive volume changing, and the last uh, uh, direction that we focus on is uh, developing multi uh, function uh, within hydrogels. So, for example, we. Um, try to incorporate some conducting materials uh, so that they can be ionically or electric, electrically conductive to serve as a, a, like a electro, soft electrode or like a, uh, or current collectors uh, so that we can build uh, like a more efficient or uh, like a um, uh, compliant material or electronics 
uh, to be in contact with uh, like a, for example, here is a heart or maybe on our skin. Um, in addition, we also use hydrogel um, to design different kinds of coating materials, uh, for example, for the function of anti-icing, anti-freezing. Um, yeah, so that's just some additional effort in our lab as well. Yeah, so with this overview, I'm gonna move forward to talk about you know, how we have been trying to achieve, uh, try to bridge the gaps that I mentioned earlier to uh, by realizing lifelike intelligence and also bio-like structures. So first, for this part, as I mentioned, this goal is to try to make the material to be intelligent, to be fully autonomous with the built-in feedback loop. Uh, they can potentially benefit energy harvesting, soft robot, or like the basic sensing and actuation functions. So yeah, just a, a couple of slides about soft robots because the uh, robot we know has been uh, the kind of a system or devices that are really mimicking and approaching the, uh, the biological functions and motions, right? So it requires a lot of uh, uh, like um, uh, material development or the engineering designs or uh, fabrications. So it's a, a really kind of an ultimate challenge to make a soft robot that uh, is approaching the level of a, a human, right? So uh, here just a list of several uh, like uh, uh, important advances in the soft robot field. So you can see uh, people were able to uh, use a different type of uh, soft materials to uh, generate motions uh, like uh, using the uh, electrical uh, or magnetic or photo or thermal energy as a uh, power. And uh, um, in order to make the, um, the this kind of actuating system to be uh, into a complete soft robot, you of course need a, a sensors, right? So, uh, so far, most of the um, soft robotics or even like those rigid uh, robotics systems typically need to integrate or physically embody um, the individual sensing unit and actuating units, right? So here you can see uh, the designs are typically pretty complex. And usually when you try to like uh, integrate this different kind of a sensing actuating units together, you usually have to encounter the challenge of uh, the interface. And because the different units or different materials may have a different type of uh, modulus or different uh, like different modulus or a different uh, um, uh, like a, um, material thermal expansion properties, right? So the interface is always an issue and the fabrication is usually uh, still pretty complex. Therefore, uh, we have been thinking, you know, as a material scientist, can we do something to make uh, or like uh, integrate all the functions within a single materials without relying on uh, like uh, uh, putting together multiple uh, individual devices into a complex system. So with this vision, uh, with this vision, uh, we look back into the current materials used for soft robots. So you can see uh, most of the current uh, like uh, uh, soft actuators uh, have been using silicon type of materials, like including PDMS, Ecoflex, polyurethane, for example. They are amazing materials, are very cheap, very easy to cast, to mold, and 3D printable. Um, so they serve as a really um, like a good structure for most of the robot, right? So uh, for the no matter it's a hydraulic or pneumatic material. So uh, silicon has been great structural materials. However, if you look at the biological systems, they not only have this uh, basic uh, uh, like a uh, body, the tissue, they have this uh, sensing actuating abilities, right? So uh, this uh, very inert uh, structural material uh, based on silicon actually don't have uh, those uh, sensing or like actuating abilities themselves, right? So uh, yeah, with this uh, uh, identified gap here, uh, we try to make uh, like a multiple functional materials, uh, soft materials to try to serve as both both uh, structure uh, and the, of the body, and also to have the function of the sensing and actuation. So with this vision, uh, over the past uh, couple of years, we have been working on how to design the material uh, to have this uh, sense, uh, smato sensory actuating abilities. So basically here, we want to make sure the material have both sensing and actuating abilities. So this material actually is a kind of a thermal responsive hydrogel polynipan, which has been really broadly studied, right? So this material typically shrink upon heating. And then 
what we did uh, in the material design is we incorporate some conducting material. For example, here, uh, we just uh, chose this uh, uh, very basic uh, conducting polymer polyaniline uh, as a secondary uh, network. So the polyaniline, the conducting material uh, can uh, serve as like a, basically two functions. First, this material is itself is black in color, so it's a natural photo absorber. Therefore, when you shine the light, uh, the, uh, the this conducting polymer can convert the light into heat to uh, trigger the shrinkage of the thermal responsive gel. Right. So therefore, this uh, um, combined this uh, hybrid material uh, gel is able to respond to heat or light to shrink responsively. So this can uh, realize this uh, photo or thermal actuation. And at the same time, this conducting material uh, actually will change its local resistivity while they are deformed. Right? So because uh, you are stretching the conducting polymer chains or you're like uh, uh, deforming the, 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 the local um, like uh, uh, space so that uh, the uh, resistant change that you real time monitor can reflect how this material is deformed. Right? So this endow the material with the sensing ability, uh, especially about the, uh, like the, the local strength. Right, so with such a material design, um, like uh, we try to realize this uh, somatosensory actuating. So here I want to show uh, some results uh, where we demonstrated this uh, uh, material can be stretched, bent, or compressed, and with the real-time reading of the resistant change. So this can truly well reflect the uh, the local deformation. Right, so this basically relies the basic uh, uh, perception uh, that, uh, um, like uh, for example, octopus or animals or even human have. Right, so with this, we want to move forward to show that this kind of a sensing ability can capture, capture and monitor the uh, actuation generated by the muscle material itself. So here. Um, you can see we basically shine a light to trigger the bending of the material. And this material itself uh, can uh, show the uh, local resistance change to reflect how this uh, curving or bending uh, has been going on, right? So basically it's able to self-sense its own uh, local motion. And uh, by coupling with the uh, external control system, uh, we are able to uh, set our targeted lens um, different length uh, for the material to achieve. So uh, the material can sense local uh, deformation or change length uh, to adjust accordingly how uh, we the material want to shrink or expand to achieve the targeted uh, length or, or, or uh, dimension. And with this ability, um, you can you can see here we are able to use a, a light triggered uh, actuation to try to grab a soft uh, uh, rods here, and uh, uh, we tried uh, several different sized rods, and this this uh, uh, like uh, this artificial muscle is able to sense the the size of the rod to uh, like uh, uh, adjust the the, cur the the bending or curvature accordingly, right by themselves, right just uh, with the assist uh, with the assistance of the uh, the external control system. Right, so with this, uh, we basically showed uh, this uh, uh, realization of the somatosensory actuation. However, during this process, we we uh, really suffered, um, you know, this uh, the, some issues like the hydrogel is in, indeed still uh, mechanically not strong enough, uh, so that uh, it's still a little bit uh, challenging to grab a heavier object, and also sometimes the motion is not really fast enough compared to our muscles, right? Uh, so this really uh, give us uh, more motivation to further uh, develop the material later. Yeah, so oh, then uh, based on this, since we were talking about soft robot, I wanted to show that, um, you know, here uh, we rely, uh, rely on the external control system, right? So basically it's a computer program. And uh, um, remember, we, we try to make the material self uh, like fully autonomous with the built-in control ability. Therefore, uh, I wanted to show a little bit of uh, additional effort where we were able to 
engineer the built-in feedback loop within the material so that they can do the uh, local computing and regulation themselves. So here we still use the poly NIPAM, which uh, uh, shrink upon heating. And uh, instead of uh, incorporating conducting polymer here, we simply just uh, embedded some uh, photo absorber. Um, so we basically just uh, mix uh, uh, different kind of absorbers uh, of choice. Like uh, it can be gold nanoparticles, can be uh, reduced graphene oxide, uh, whatever nanoparticles that can absorb light. And you just uh, mix it in the precursor solution of the gel and you cure into uh, uh, like a, a gel material. So here we just have this a very simple uh, cylindrical uh, pillar and we shine a light on it. And then this will generate a local heating and this uh, uh, local heating will cause a local shrinkage of the material and then it will cause the bending over. And then uh, this bending actually um, will uh, continue until the pillar uh, approach the direction of the in incident light, right? And uh, our goal is to try to achieve the, uh, the light control the motion or bending angle. And the question, the key challenge here is how we can make sure the pillar knows this is a moment that pillar has uh, achieved this uh, light incident direction. So during the experiment, we found actually, once this pillar approached this uh, beam um, like a direction, the tip itself will start to block the light from shining on this uh, hinge area. So this will cause the local cooling of this hinge. And this cooling will trigger the, uh, uh, the swelling or expansion so that the pillar start to uh, straighten up. So the tip will lift up and this will allow the light to shine back on the hinge area. So this will make the pillar to start to bend over again. And this uh, over bending will block the light again, right? So here you can see basically this uh, pillar uh, under the illumination actually will go uh, under this uh, be between this uh, over bending and under bending uh, configuration. And this two configuration compete until this uh, pillar uh, find the most comfortable uh, equilibrium state of aiming, right? So here it doesn't use uh, any computer programming or any human intervention. It's purely uh, the light material interaction uh, generate this uh, uh, this uh, uh, beauty and feedback loop so that it can adjust its own bending direction so that it can always point steadily to, uh, to the instant light angle, right? So this is just a, such a simple way to achieve this uh, beauty and feedback loop, right? So with this, uh, oh yeah, so once you turn off the light, um, because uh, we introduced at the beginning, this hydrogel so volume changing is uh, fully rever uh, re reversible so that uh, the gel will recover to the uh, upright position uh, to be ready for the next round of uh, bending. So yeah, with this um, pointing, uh, during the experiment, my student, uh, Yusen, actually he like uh, observed that sometimes the pillar, uh, instead of uh, steadily pointing the light, sometimes it oscillate. And we wanted to make sure this is not really accident. And then uh, we basically, uh, he designed a very simple experiment uh, where we have the hydrogel with a different degree of uh, cross-linking. So we changed the uh, amount of uh, cross-linkers in the gel so that the, some gels with high cross-linking density is uh, responsive uh, slow, uh, more slowly and some gels can respond more faster. So uh, like so that uh, you can see here, the, this uh, um, slowly responsive gel tend to uh, be uh, pointing steadily to the light, whereas this uh, fast responsive gel tend to oscillate. Right, so then we thought probably this is a kind of a non-equilibrium oscillation. Right, so basically it's been really like a, a showing the showing the, the, this uh, under bending, over bending uh, uh, configurations uh, more uh, like a clearly here. So with this, then we did a systematic study to really uh, understand this uh, oscillation. And we basically shine the light from multiple arbitrary incident angle. So you can see this pillar can always oscillate very, very well, uh, very robust. And you can see the uh, measured frequency typically don't change um, with the uh, incident angle. Um, so no matter what angle you shine the light from, 
um, this pillar can always oscillate very well. And uh, we also change the light from different angle in the horizontal plane as well. And the frequencies are also very uh, constant. So with this, we know, basically figure out the uh, hydrogels uh, um, like a condition to achieve the oscillation. And with this, we wanted to understand how exactly this uh, oscillation may be tuned and what are the parameters that can influence the oscillation behavior, for example, the frequency or the amplitude of the oscillation. So we collaborated with our colleague Li Hua at UCLA um, to try to uh, develop an analytical model. And based on this, uh, the model, uh, like uh, what we can see here, uh, the second uh, graphs uh, for both the, um, the like uh, uh, the, the, the pillars of a different uh, diameter or different uh, arm length, uh, the, uh, the, this uh, um, simulated result can uh, agree very well with the, with the experimentally measured uh, frequency and, uh, and uh, uh, amplitude. Uh, when we use a different arm length uh, or using different uh, uh, thickness of the pillar, right? So basically we found uh, we can use a, a different arm length, different arm diameter or the crossing density as I showed in the previous slide to um, control and tune the amplitude and frequency of the oscillation so that we have a really good controllability and the tunability about the kinetics of the oscillation. And then with this, finally, we did a very basic uh, demonstration. Uh, so here we made we made a piece of a gel uh, as the surfing board with a little tail. The whole thing is made of the same gel. So we didn't really do very fancy optimization of the geometry or, or like any special design of this little swimmer. And here you can see when we shine the light, it actually lift up this little tail. So it start to oscillate around the beam of the light coming from here. And then this uh, oscillation can generate a sufficient uh, propulsion force to, for the little swimmer to swim away from the light. This really demonstrates this interesting phototaxis behavior, uh, like a lot of uh, insects or animals can do, right? So, and then I here, I wanted to point out with this uh, old gel based uh, um, like system, um, it has advantage of uh, uh, of this uh, uh, shaped uh, changing or uh, shrinkage, so that when you don't use this uh, soft robot, you just uh, leave it uh, on the counter. It will dry to about one twentieth of the original volume, uh, so you can store it as a tiny uh, in a tiny space. And then when you need to use it again, you just uh, dump it in water, so it will re-swell back to the original size, and you can redeploy this uh, soft robot to let it uh, work. Right. So this really just a uh, features a uh, of uh, like being an old soft robot. All right, so with this, uh, I just wanted to wrap up this uh, uh, first part uh, to show that how we are able to use uh, this uh, very homogeneous material, very simple geometry, which uh, uh, can respond to light uh, symmetrically, uh, but uh, by introducing the light uh, like uh, directionally, we're able to uh, achieve this asymmetric actuation. And due to this uh, reversible volume changing feature of the gel, we're able to close the loop to realize the self-regulation so that we can achieve either phototaxis uh, like the swimmer or the phototropism uh, like the light tracking we saw earlier. So just wanted to show this uh, principle again here. Um, in this demonstration, it's uh, light and uh, photoresponsive gel. However, actually this uh, principle is really universal. You can basically replace the light with uh, many different types of electromagnetic waves. So you can change the wavelength or the frequency, uh, or you can even use like uh, acoustic waves and uh, uh, even change it to thermal or chemical flux. And the material doesn't really have to be hydrogel. It can be like a liquid crystal elastomers or any stimuli responsive material. Um, so they can, uh, as long as it's a, like a reversible uh, changing, uh, you should be able to achieve this uh, um, built-in feedback loop to realize the self-regulated behavior or motion. All right, so that's basically what I wanted to show for the our effort on realizing the uh, realizing the lifelike intelligence. So uh, 
if you remember, I mentioned that while we were developing this kind of like a, a dynamic uh, like features or motions uh, in the past few uh, works, works, we really suffered uh, from this uh, you know, weakness and also the slowness of the hydrogel. Therefore, we also put in some effort to try to further improve the materials uh, from the basic structures and the properties perspective. So uh, we, our goal is to try to uh, maintain this attractive power structure being really wet and soft and stretchable, but at the same time, we try to improve the toughness and the fatigue resistance so that they can be really useful for practical applications to generate enough force and also can be uh, like compatible with 3D printing. So the uh, first work on this effort I wanted to show is uh, truly inspired by muscle and especially some hopping animals. So um, because uh, uh, usually when we when people try to make the like soft material uh, to be stronger uh, so that they can generate a larger force, usually it compromises the speed. So the, the motion or the actuation become a lot slower. Or sometimes if you try to make the motion faster, uh, you usually will uh, unavoidably make the force smaller or make the material weaker. Right? So this has been like intrinsic conflict between the, um, the speed and the force in the basic material design. So uh, when we look at how you know this uh, uh, like hopping like like material uh, animals like uh, uh, frogs uh, can generate such a high amount of a contractile force to enable this uh, like a uh, high and fast uh, hopping, we realize actually they have uh, some unique design, the recoil-like design, where uh, they can uh, store the elastic energy in the muscle. And then when they are ready to hop, they can release this uh, amount of uh, stored elastic energy to generate really like uh, this strong uh, like contractile force. Um, so with this, we thought about a material design where we uh, introduce some functional group in the polymer chain. And uh, um, this uh, functional groups are able to form complexation bands with the, uh, some introduced ions. For example, here, iron ions can um, form this uh, complexation um, to uh, fix the polymer network upon stretching. So basically what we do is we stretch the material in the presence of the iron ion, and then this uh, um, this uh, band formation can lock the material at this uh, stretched uh, position. So this uh, amount of uh, uh, elastic energy can be well restored, well, well stored in this uh, uh, gel network. And then uh, you can also see this alignment uh, structure, uh, aligned structure in the gel. And uh, uh, when we are ready to release this amount of stored energy, we basically just uh, either shine light or we just uh, uh, like a slightly tailored local uh, pH. So this can trigger the dissociation, dissociation of the iron ions from the network. So this will trigger the relaxation of this uh, uh, polymer gel network so that it can recover to the original dimension. So by such a basic uh, uh, material design, we were able to achieve this uh, programmable uh, shape changing, and also this uh, uh, like uh, this uh, contraction can generate a, a much higher amount of force and uh, um, consequently higher working density. So with this, we compare with the uh, the the conventional osmotic uh, pressure driven hydrogel, and you can see. With this controlled uh, energy storage and release, uh, we are able to generate a much higher stress and uh, uh, like a higher uh, contraction for uh, strength and uh, uh, while maintaining this uh, high water content and uh, at the same time improving the work density, power density and efficiency. And so when we compare this elastic gel with the biological muscle, uh, they can actually outperform the muscles, except this uh, power density here we found actually because this uh, uh, speed is still not really comparable to the real muscles uh, contraction speed. Yeah. So with these features, uh, the, this, uh, this type of gel is uh, stronger, more powerful, and faster. So that here you can see we were able to uh, lift a, a fairly heavy weight where the uh, osmotic 
conventional gel couldn't. Uh, and also because of this uh, directionality and the programmability of this uh, gel's uh, deformation, we're able to control the expansion or shrinkage direction uh, uni <coughs> unidirectionally. <coughs> Yeah, so uh, this potentially can be used for some uh, uh, like a kind of expansion or wound closing. All right, so with this, um, we hopefully I have convinced you that uh, we're able to design the materials uh, chemistry and the structure to uh, generate higher contractile force. However, if you look at the gel itself, um, it's still just like a basic, uh, uh, typical hydrogel uh, network, right? So it doesn't really have a intrinsically uh, higher strength or toughness. Therefore, um, <clears throat> we look back at the basic uh, uh, gel mechanics to try to find out, you know, some um, uh, places where we may uh, like uh, uh, do something to improve the intrinsic uh, mechanical property of the gel. So we know this uh, kind of a uh, gel or polymer networks uh, um, like toughness is actually all determined by the basic uh, individual chains fracture uh, energy, right? So um, in order to make the whole network being stronger so that uh, people have tried to design this a uh, perfect network where the external apply, externally applied uh, tensile stress um, is uh, uh, distributed across this uh, entire network, uh, which has this uh, completely uniform uh, chain length and uh, the uniform uh, grid size so that uh, this uh, material turned out to be really uh, tough and strong. However, you can tell this design is uh, very unique, right? you need to have a special uh, like a, a building blocks and you have to use a very careful uh, material design and synthesis. So this uh, uh, general generality of this method may not be very high. high. And uh, therefore over the past uh, uh, decade or, or, or more, um, people developed uh, another very, very uh, um, like a effective and uh, uh, powerful uh, strategy uh, based on double network. So pioneered by Professor Jian, Bing, uh, uh, Jian Ping Gong and uh, uh, Zhi Gangsu, uh, uh, people figure out this uh, by introducing the secondary um, like a network into the primary hydrogen network. The, high, the second network may uh, dissipate or dampen the, uh, the energy uh, the, uh, from the uh, externally applied tensile stress so that uh, this is second network, net second polymer networks uh, uh, like a breakage may protect or dissipate the energy to protect the primary hydrogel network so that um, the, it can overall improve the, uh, the, the, the gel's mechanical property. And for example, here, if you use such a um, like alginate based uh, second network, uh, which is uh, complex uh, uh, by the calcium ions, they are able to slide and like a zip and zip to realize the energy dissipation so that this is a really uh, like an iconic classic double network uh, demonstration. And following that, there has been many uh, like related uh, strategies, like for example, using some folded domains, which can unfold or fold to improve this uh, uh, stretchability and the, uh, the strength. And uh, people have been using freeze casting to generate this kind of aligned structure uh, or by using mechanical training uh, to try to prepare the polymer uh, chains uh, for the, uh, uh, the, the external stretching. So there, there's, so many uh, very effective methods. However, most of this uh, rely on like post treatment and also like a not really like a bottom up a strategy, like how our tendons or muscles grow uh, into that kind of a, a formation, right? Uh, therefore, uh, we wanted to look at how we are able to manipulate the, the individual building blocks, um, like a configuration to make a bottom up um, method to achieve a tougher gel. So um, we basically uh, found that uh, uh, this is a very classic uh, uh, half master effect, uh, very well known in chemistry, um, may be helpful. So half master effect is describing uh, the different type of uh, ions 
may have a, a different uh, um, abilities of uh, interacting with the polymer chains and water molecules. So for example, the half master series is like this for uh, the ions on the left hand side, they are more like a salting out uh, ions where the ions can deprive the water molecule from the polymer chains so that uh, the originally the water surrounding uh, the, the water surrounding uh, configuration will be uh, changed by introducing these ions. So without water around, this uh, uh, polymer chain tend to form uh, the secondary forms, uh, the force between the chains. So for example, if you use a polyvinyl alcohol with a lot of OH group, uh, the polymer chain uh, will tend to have, a, uh, like a, tend to form the hydrogen bands between the, uh, between the polymer chains. So they start to aggregate um, between themselves without water molecules around, which were deprived by this uh, salting out ions, right? So we call this process as a salting out. Um, so this can, can really uh, introduce more aggregation between the polymer chains. So this uh, polymer network become denser and uh, uh, overall the network become stronger. And on the other hand, if you choose ions on the other end of this uh, half master series, uh, these ions tend to introduce water molecules or release water molecules back onto the, uh, onto the polymer chains so that the, uh, the polymer chains become surrounded by water molecule again, so they don't have as strong aggregation or hydrogen bands between the chains so that the polymer chains uh, network become looser and the whole network become weak, weaker. So this is the mechanism based on half master effect by using different ions, you can see uh, like a anions or cations uh, with this uh, really broad choices, you are able to continuously tune the modulus of the material very effectively. So with this, then we basically, oh, here it shows, you know, how uh, by soaking the gel uh, into the, uh, the salt solution over uh, the period of 48 hours, uh, the polymer's uh, power structure uh, gradually changed. And, and accordingly, we can see the crystallinity increase uh, or decrease, and also the, uh, the corresponding mechanical property change as well. So basically with this, we thought about, okay, how can we utilize the half master effect to you know, improve the toughness? And then again, you know, we, we, we noticed uh, um, so many strong um, like biomaterials have, have been using this uh, complex hierarchical structure where they have uh, features, unique features at a multiple length scales from like millimeter, centimeter uh, to uh, uh, like, sorry, meter, centimeter, millimeter, micron to nano, all the way down to molecular level, right? So uh, similarly for the uh, nakers and also the muscles or tendons, right? And indeed, uh, most of the reported tough hydrogels are still not very comparable to these uh, natural materials like a uh, synthetic rubber or spider silk uh, or the tendons, right? So we do see there's still gap between the current uh, like a tough, tough gel strategy um, and the uh, natural soft uh, uh, low bearing tissues. Therefore, uh, with this, we try to achieve this hierarchical structure uh, by using the half master effect coupled with this uh, freeze, this uh, like a freeze casting method. So what we do is uh, um, we start with this uh, polymer solution. So here the model material is polyvinyl alcohol because it has the simplest backbone and also re very rich in OH group so that they can form really nice uh, hydrogen bands uh, to improve the aggregation. So with uh, the PVA solution, we start a directional freezing uh, to introduce this kind of micron scale uh, like aligned structure. So here you can see this uh, uh, formation of this uh, ice uh, uh, columns will squeeze the polymer chains into this uh, honeycomb walls. Uh, so here basically this uh, polymer become a little bit denser and they are prepared to be uh, more adjacent 
from each other. And then following this uh, directional, directional freezing, we basically throw this uh, frozen uh, gel into not a fully um, like a, a cured gel yet, uh, this uh, frozen material into uh, a certain salt solution. So here we choose uh, both the cation and anion as the salting out species. So um, these ions will uh, start this uh, salting out process for the polymer. And then the polymer chain start to aggregate um, with this uh, uh, denser hydrogen bands of uh, like uh, initiated uh, like a nano fibers. And then, um, so this uh, uh, like a morphology was confirmed by the, uh, by the, uh, the SEM uh, imaging method. So here you can see indeed uh, by using such a, a simple method, uh, we are able to achieve this uh, uh, material which has a really similar appearance as a real tendon with this uh, shimmering effect. And uh, um, at a micro level, you have uh, this uh, uh, multiple like uh, uh, microfibers. And if you zoom in one single fiber, you can see it's actually um, like featured by a lot of uh, nanofibrils covered on the surface, and then each indi individual fibers is actually facilitated by the formation of hydrogen bands here. So um, this is really like showing the, uh, the features at a multiple length scale to approach this uh, hierarchical structure with this uh, aligned and isotropic features. So with this, we further uh, uh, like uh, uh, went down to uh, do the mechanical test. So here you can see the material is still very, very stretchable, well become a lot uh, like uh, uh, stronger uh, with higher strengths. And also with this uh, nice uh, uh, like hierarchical structure, uh, even with this uh, pre-made notch during the stretching, uh, it's, it shows a very, very desirable flaw in sensitivity. And also here, this video shows this uh, natural tendon uh, that uh, um, my student purchased from the Busher store, and this is the looking of uh, of the uh, of the synthetic uh, gel. And uh, also, they're both very uh, strong. As you can see, you can stretch and twist without uh, breaking this material. Um, whereas uh, a lot of uh, traditional gels, you, you couldn't even pick it up from the solution. And here, they're both able to lift a heavy uh, weight, right? So yeah. So with this, we quantitatively. Uh, summarize the uh, the mechanical properties of uh, uh, the the PVA uh, tough gel, and you can see um, you know they can be uh, about a hundred times stronger and thousand times tougher, while being still very stretchable up to like thirty times, um, and also maintaining this uh, high water content. Because a lot of uh, uh, some other reported toughening methods sometimes could not avoid uh, uh, the undesirable loss or drop of the water content. For a lot of uh, biomedical applications, you still want to have this uh, wetness and this uh, soft uh, like high water content. And another uh, really important feature is this method is so universal and simple. So basically it can, apply, can be applied to almost any kind of uh, like a uh, um, hydrophilic polymers like uh, alginate, cellulose, right? So, uh, and also this method is very scalable. Um, so basically it's not limited by the by anything uh, of the, the fabrication process. As long as you are able to freeze it and uh, soak it in, in salt, you can prepare large sized uh, tough gel. All right, so with this uh, last feature I wanted to quickly show is this uh, fatigue resistance. So here we, we showed that uh, benefiting from this uh, connected uh, uh, nano fibril network, uh, actually this material is able to kind of uh, uh, like have this uh, stress uh, pass detoured upon the, uh, the, the, the stretching without uh, letting the crack uh, propagate easily. Therefore, this uh, uh, material shows a very nice uh, fatigue resistance as well. And uh, last the feature is, uh, you know, with this method, it's very compatible with the other function, uh, post function not, not, uh, functionalization. So here we were able to introduce conducting polymer into this uh, tough PVA gel, so that a, as we I showed earlier, this material is uh, electrically conductive. So while you stretch or deform the material, this uh, uh, measured resistance can reflect the uh, deformation or motion of this material, right? So it basically can serve as a nice motion sensing material uh, as part of the soft robot, for example. Um, yeah, so with this, I wanted to show that um, currently we have been, um, uh, let me 
yeah, we have been uh, trying to continue our effort uh, in several directions. So because by using different ions or different concentrations, we are able to tune the uh, modulus stiffness across a very broad range, which cover almost all type of tissues in our body. And also by choosing the right type of uh, solutions, we can achieve even the anti-freezing abilities, uh, which may benefit the current uh, hydraulic uh, actuator. And also we're able to, we're able to uh, print uh, this uh, stimuli responsive tough gel where we can uh, use uh, this uh, heating to, gen to trigger this uh, uh, grasping motion uh, while having this uh, much higher uh, like a contraction uh, force compared to the traditional uh, weaker gel. And uh, we can also use me this method to reinforce some uh, uh, fragile inorganic scaffold so that this overall uh, tough gel coated uh, 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 like uh, the scaffold uh, as uh, like uh, uh, electrical uh, devices uh, may be like highly flexible. Uh, for example, here, this is a supercapacitor coated by this, uh, uh, the tough gel on the, the inorganic scaffold. And also we are trying to make uh, uh, this uh, method compatible with the 3D printing uh, so that uh, we can achieve both this high toughness while further improving the uh, resolution. Yeah, so these are some ongoing effort. And then with this, just one last part related to this method is, um, by using this uh, um, method, we are also trying to develop a, uh, like a robust, uh, tough and flexible, stretchable uh, uh, conducting materials, which may benefit the variable electronic materials. So in this field, um, people, the, uh, one of the intrinsic uh, um, challenge is uh, how to maintain this uh, attractive uh, uh, stretchability of uh, soft like gels or polymers while improving the conductivity to reach the desirable level as the inorganic counterpart, right? So um, one of the uh, like, uh, uh, like issues is uh, uh, when we introduce uh, in conducting components, they tend to form this uh, nano uh, uh, aggregates these uh, individual islands, as you can imagine, may not facilitate the continuous electron transport, right? So especially when you stretch it, these uh, uh, like uh, clumps uh, don't really deform accordingly following the deformation of the bulk material. Therefore, this uh, sensing may not be truly um, like a uh, uh, reflect the deformation of the bulk material. So um, one of the goal um, in our effort is to try to mitigate this uh, nano aggregates by using uh, uh, like a modified uh, synthesis process. So here we also use this uh, freezing method and also the low, uh, low temperature polymerization. We, our goal is to try to um, form this uh, smooth uh, continuous nano network inside the material so that uh, it may uh, improve the electrical conductivity while maintaining this uh, high stretchability of the gel. So, here uh, by using ice templating followed by uh, like a low temperature polymerization, basically below zero degree C, we can meet, we can like uh, uh, suppress this uh, rigorous uh, uh, polymerization process. So it can prevent the, um, the, the conducting polymer from forming these nano aggregates. So here you can see um, in the, by using this method, we're able to achieve this uh, uh, more smooth uh, con connected, uh, uh, like interconnected uh, nano network. And uh, this formed this uh, uh, micron uh, continuous uh, network. And then, so overall it shows a certain type of uh, hierarchical structure as well. And then with this uh, uh, structure, we were able to achieve this uh, enhanced mechanical uh, uh, um, uh, toughness were about 30 times compared to this uh, uh, control sample and also improvement of electrical conductivity as well as the electrical chemical uh, uh, properties. So with this, I want to quickly show some uh, demonstration. The first uh, application is uh, uh, to do the string sensing. So here you can see 
a, this material attached on the elbow is able to monitor this uh, large motion, or if you attach it on the throat, you are able to detect this uh, tiny vibration as well. So it really shows this uh, broad linear direction, direct de detection range, um, like uh, uh, and also this uh, higher sensitivity. This is truly attributed to this uh, uh, nice interconnected uh, nano network in this uh, kind of uh, um, hierarchical structure. So secondly, uh, we also try to apply this material to build this uh, flexible, stretchable solid state supercapacitor. You can see, um, you know, with this uh, basic uh, um, design, we're able to make uh, uh, this uh, a serial connected, serially connected supercapacitor, and uh, we can put it on arm. Uh, you know, this can be uh, like a potentially a good or variable electronic devices. All right, so that's basically all I have for this part. Um, let's see. Yeah, so, oops. <laughs> so hopefully today I've shown you, you know, by using the, um, like a lot of us uh, strategies that we learn from nature, we're able to tailor the structure of the material to improve the uh, properties like mechanical property, and also can use uh, uh, this kind of a stimuli responsiveness of the, uh, the hydrogel or like different kind of polymers to achieve some uh, self-regulated motion to benefit energy harvesting or like uh, the robotics uh, systems. And then with this, I wanted to just stop here. And I really wanted to thank all my students and postdocs who made all this possible. And our collaborators uh, from uh, Zhigang Suo, uh, Jerry, Hanqing, Lauren, uh, Laurent Long, and Li Hua, and uh, uh, Professor T.C. Chao uh, at UCLA, um, and all the funding agencies. All right, so that's all for my talk. And thank you for your time and attention. Questions are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Shimi. Truly inspiring talk. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if you have uh, um, any questions, feel free to put your questions directly in the chat box. Or you can also raise, uh, click the hand raise button uh, so that you can ask uh, questions in person. So we have a question from uh, attendee. Uh, let me uh, allow to talk, okay. I, uh, Yu Yang Wang, I think you can ask a question. Uh, hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, um, Dr. He, it's a really good presentation, and it's great. And, uh, um, and also, like, the way you present is really impressive. But uh, I, have some, uh, I have some questions. So um, I'm Tom, and uh, I'm a third-year PhD student, and I'm also a self soft matter guy that uh, but I spend most of my, my time working in 3D printing of electroactive polymers that in the soft robotics and the supercapacitor applications. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I was uh, having some questions on the uh, slide 14 mm -hmm. uh, that, you, uh, that you mentioned about adding some conducting polymers in, on, the, uh, on, the, on the surface or, 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 or like the, I don't know, as a feeder or something uh, to, uh, uh, to make a blackout system and also it can, uh, change the local resistance. Uh, that's there's, there's a pretty cool design. So I was I was I was wondering like how you add these conducting polymers by uh, copolymerization or just adding a feeder or just you coat coat them on the surface. Mm. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the self introduction. And this is uh, a very good question. Indeed, the, actually, if you look at this design, it's not really, you know, surprising or new at all. And people know you, you can simply mix two different polymers into a hybrid polymer network. This is uh, um, indeed a very basic uh, idea many people can think of. And so you ask a really great question indeed, uh, introducing conducting polymer, letting them, the, letting the gel, the hydrogel and the conducting polymer, co-polymerize or like maybe sequentially polymerize is tricky because uh, for example, uh, their polymerization conditions are different and conducting polymers, as I showed uh, at the end of talk, uh, tend to polymerize very rigorously. So they may, may for, uh, like uh, form those uh, nano aggregates or so typically, um, with this basic design, the idea is simple, but the, the, the polymerization or the resulting uh, polymers usually don't have uh, this uh, desirable mechanical property and uh, electric conductivity at the same time. Okay. 
Yeah. Therefore, my answer to this uh, to your question is. Uh, here we actually indeed utilize uh, uh, this uh, uh, temperature control of the polymerization so that we can kind of uh, tailor the uh, the uh, direction kinetics and also we uh, use uh, like a uh, some uh, uh, like a design of a sequential uh, uh, polymerization so that uh, depending on the different reaction rate, one would polymerize first uh, while the other monomer is still inside of the, the gel because the, the reason why I'm talk, I'm, talk, I'm I'm introducing this strategy just because previously people have tried to form the gel hydrogel first and then try to soak uh, the conducting monomer conducting polymers monomer inside of the network and it turned out to be really tricky and it's not always very efficient in terms of uh, absorbing e enough monomers inside and also uh, this. Uh, uh, the once the polymerization of the conducting polymer starts, it tend to generate a lot of heat, and that make the conduct make this uh, thermal gel start to shrink, which will further block the infiltration of the uh, the the uh, the what was that the the the, the, the monomer and the uh, the uh, the cross linkers to. Uh, go inside of the gel. Therefore, uh, you, you may find typically you will form a black skin on the surface, right? So yeah, so we actually tried a lot of effort, uh, like put a lot of effort to develop this uh, this uh, unique uh, synthesis process that ensure this uh, um, desirable uh, design was achieved. Yeah, so uh, for more details of the fabrication or synthesis process, you can refer to this method, uh, this, this paper, yeah. Oh yeah, um, th this is a really good explanation. And, uh, yeah, that's good. Um, and uh, if we, if we have uh, more time, I would like to ask uh, two more questions. Um, uh, what about this? Let me. Uh, I think there's one question in the chat box. So I uh, let me allow this. Uh, uh, Yi Liang ask first. Then you can ask later. Is that okay? So I, yeah. I hope uh, more people to have the chances to ask questions. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So the second question is from uh uh Nuan Yi Liang. Uh, so his question is uh he's wondering if the hydrogel soft robot uh became sensitive to microbial degradation, uh since it has a high water content and become more bicompatible. Uh, is any uh, relevant related research going on? Mm, become sensitive to micro degradation. Um so if I understand correctly, this question is uh, is saying, you know, hydrogel has a high water content, and and how can we ensure it is biocompatible? It is uh, sensitive to microbial uh, degradation. Um, actually, yeah, that's a good question too, uh, because uh, indeed, uh, like uh, for tissue engineering people, they 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 use gel all the time to grow cells or uh, like seed or cultural cells. Um, so we have been trying to, um, I didn't get a chance to present here, uh, growing cells inside or on the surface of this uh, uh, gels for tissue scaffold, for uh, uh, like a, a mass or tendon replacement. And uh, um, it really depends on the composition of the hydrogels. So for example, if we are using like a PVA, uh, which is known very biocompatible and uh, we know it's a P, uh, FDA approved material. So it doesn't have any issue with the cell growing. And uh, um, so we have been showing being able to grow cells like different type of cells, including fibroblastic cells or lung cells, um, like uh, um, actually multiple different cells on the or inside of a gel for a really long time, like over even weeks or months without any uh, issue. Uh, of course, you have to make sure you have a thoroughly uh, rinse off the, you know, any residue molecules and the sterilize the gel as you have to do with any other type of gels, right? Um, and uh, at the same time, we also have been trying to tailor the property of the gel, sometimes we have to introduce in, we have to introduce some different type of cross linkers, which may be not very, very uh, cell friendly. Sometimes it may have a little cytotoxicity. Uh, and for those uh, we found that could be issue. And then for those uh, either we have to replace the, uh, the, the, the cross linkers so that make sure all the components in the, in the gel are uh, um, 
well compatible. But you know, I, actually, for some other uh, applications where you try to prevent the undesirable tissue, uh, like scar tissue formation, or maybe some cell uh, or microbial uh, settlement. Actually, you want to have uh, some protein resistant uh, components there to prevent those uh, undesirable events from happening. So for those, uh, by introducing some like a minorly like a cell unfriendly components there, we found uh, actually that can prevent the, the undesirable cell um, uh, growing there uh, to make sure this tissue will not have a, like a, a, it trigger some a tissue, a scar tissue formation, for example. Yeah, so basically, you know, these are just uh, some experience we have so far and uh, uh, um, but Overall, it's really true, uh, truly depends on the, the actual composition of your gel. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Yuyang, I think you can uh, ask other questions. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, actually, I have two questions from page uh, 19. Sure. Um, so here, uh, I, I got one technical question, uh, which may sound very silly, very stupid. Um, so basically in your system, you need to have, uh, you need to bl block the light, right? For creating a black box and uh, then cast that straight line as you show in the video to a single point of the uh, soft robotics. And uh, I was wondering like how you able to record, record this video while like the system is all blacked out. And the second question is like, I know the previous sounds very stupid, but the second one is like, I saw you, in the next slide, you use different temperatures um, on the actuating the soft robotics. And uh, I, I don't know, like, will, you, will the temperature affect the probability of the uh, thermal responsive behavior of the soft robotics? Okay. Okay. So the first question is how do we shoot the video while it's black? Is that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, actually, you know, we for this demonstration, we use uh, lasers. Uh, of course, later uh, in, in the paper, uh, in the other paper as well, we demonstrated we can use a uh, uh, sunlight or like a natural light as well. For this particular experiment where we use a laser, you know, so uh, this laser can like because in the box, uh, in the kind of a um, uh, like a, the enclosing system, the the laser will be reflected um, by the uh, border of the 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 like the the, the box, so that you actually see uh, it, it's not completely black. And also here, in order to um, uh, protect the uh, eyes and also the the lens, everything we actually put a, a lens in between the camera and the 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 the, the sample. Uh, so uh, this will allow enough uh, light to 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 be able to take photo and videos. Yeah. So so it's not completely black. And second question is you were asking about the temperature sensitivity. Uh, yeah, so most of the experiment were done at a room temperature. And uh, oh, actually that's a great question. I don't know if I have a slide here. Uh, in the related work, uh, probably I don't have the slides here. Uh, in this, in this, uh, in this, work uh, we, we published on Nature Nanotechnology in 2019, uh, where we showed indeed you were able to change or tune the, uh, the, the uh, transition temperature of uh, uh, polynapam um, in a very broad, broad uh, temperature range. It can be as low as a minus three degree C, you know, as long as the, the water it doesn't freeze, right? And, or all the way to around like 70 degree C before water start to boil, right? Uh, yeah, so, so basically um, by tuning the, the, this, uh, uh, the gel, you were able to make this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, regulated motion to happen any, at any desirable temperature range. Yeah, so basically this is really attributed to the, uh, the tunability of the temperature uh, responsiveness of the gel. Yeah, hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, yeah sure, uh, thank you a lot. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation like about the souping pastures and, uh, and uh, like you talk about like some physical hydrogels and I really learned, learned a lot from you, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I got no questions. Okay, thanks for a nice work. Thank you. Oh, next question goes to uh, uh, Kuang Xiao. Go ahead. 
Okay, thank you, Sunshin. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor He. This is Xiao Quan, uh, professor in Dr. Chi's group. So now I'm in Harvard Medical School. Uh, oh. Many great work, uh, wonderful uh, talk. So actually, I have a question about the a recent Nature paper, uh, the very tough PVA hydrogen. Mm. So, uh, yeah, yes. So uh, you mentioned uh, the pour, uh, the water content is ninety percent for this mm. kind of robust hydrogel. Mm. You also mentioned it's highly porous. So mm. I have a question: How to how did you count this porosity? Does it mean ninety percent water content? Uh, uh, the porosity is ninety percent. Yes, you're right. Yeah. So you may yeah I know people may wonder. Okay, so how can you make the gel so much stronger while still able to maintain this uh, high porosity or high water content, right? Yeah. So, right. Is that basically where you you got come like a uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah. in this case, uh, does it mean the matrix the PVA the very dense PVA matrix mm -hmm. is um you know they are in form crystals so there is not they should also absorbs and some amount of water, that's to say there's still a hydrogen state. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the PVA matrix also has some water content itself, mm -hmm. uh, except for the porous area, they have a lot of, a bunch of uh, water, right? Yep, right. So that, that might be part of the reason. Uh, however, I would say the reason why here we, we, we didn't compromise the water content or the porosity, just because here this uh, strengthening truly comes from this uh, tight or like a dense aggregation between the polymer chain without losing the, 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 the like a, a large amount of pores here, right? Um, yeah, so in like uh, in the past, a lot of uh, uh, strengthening or toughening method, they simply, for example, we, we can simply uh, add more cross linkers. So you have a more uh, like a like a higher solid solid fraction, um, and accordingly you will have a lower uh, porosity, lower water content. Whereas here here we didn't really introduce more cross linking points, or we didn't introduce more polymers here. We simply just make each individual nano level building blocks denser, right? So so that you still allow a lot of rooms for the water to exist. Right, mm -hmm. and also you're absolutely right. Uh, like even within this uh, dense uh, uh, nanofibrils, uh, it has a higher crystallinity here. Indeed, uh, in I didn't include that uh, image uh, from the XRD. We showed uh, this uh, higher cross uh, crystallinity, uh, like uh, over over the period of uh, uh, sorting out uh, process. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even though the cross link, the cross link dense, oh, sorry, the crystallinity increased, uh, it still maintains a certain amount of water inside. Um, I think that contributed to that a uh, little bit as well. But the the major difference from the previous uh, method where people tend to like just uh, like a uh, uh, simply increasing the crossing density, here we didn't introduce more solid. We basically just make the the solid portion denser. If that's, okay, uh, great, great. So, yeah. so I may have a bit follow up question. So mm -hmm. what is uh, about the long term stability of this kind of totally physically cross link network? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this may also related to uh, uh, how this kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, physical, this people may introduce people prefer to use a bit amount of chemical cross linking to maintain the long term stability. So mm -hmm. if you have a, uh, so this is a compromise long term stability and uh, uh, degrade a bit or how to say degradability yeah yeah that, that's another great question yes indeed actually this method uh what, what like once we have uh, complete this this uh, whole synthesis process uh we usually soak this uh, uh finished gel in pure water to rinse off the residue ions uh what we observe is uh, uh the mechanical property uh, will drop a little bit, but still much, much higher than the, uh, this, the, the initial state. So um, we can actually remove almost all the ions and the, the, this, uh, this uh, dense uh, network and all the structure actually are still well maintained as we found. Uh, yeah, so I would say in this kind of like a neutral or like a, a mild uh, environment or solution, uh, this kind of physically cross-linked uh, uh, structure uh, can be pretty well maintained. However, 
you're right. Uh, if at this moment, if you introduce some other ions or other like uh, uh, conditions, which will disrupt the this uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, like hydrogen balance between that can truly like a like a de dissociate this uh, network and uh, uh, yeah because as as you said it's not chemically crosslinked uh, as long as you don't introduce like a uh, some salting salting in ions uh, the structure can be maintained and uh, the way to prevent this from happening let's say if you want to fix the structure here and to um, for some long term usage then then actually we did uh, uh, develop some method that allows you to introduce a chemical cross-linking. For example, in this paper, uh, in, sorry, this slide is slow because it's a huge file. Uh, yeah, so, so in this work, um, we introduce uh, uh, the chemical crosslink here, so that this uh, uh, the whole structure, everything is uh, fully fixed there, and uh, um, also this allows the three D printing as well. Yeah, so uh, so you, you can definitely do some post treatment to fix the structure if you want to have a really longer term stability, uh, even in more harsh environment. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for the detailed question. Thank you. Congrats for so many Thank good you. Thank you, So regarding this question, I can also share some of my uh, data. Actually, I have some, but it's on PVA, not uh, using different methods. Mm -hmm. So for free soil PVA, actually, we did actually soak the sample for three months. We didn't uh, observe degradation. So we found actually the hydrogen bond in PVA is much stronger than majority, uh, many other types of physical Cross link the uh, hydrogen. So, and uh, we actually have one application, right? We put uh, this uh, actually this one PV in stomach. The pH value is about the pH uh, to one to three. And initially, we actually try some other hydrogels. They are also claim using a physical crossing hydrogel. And uh, the case, they, they degrade a lot. So, majority of the, this kind of physical crossing hydrogel, they're actually sensitive you know, to pH, sensitive to water. But somehow for PVA, uh, is, uh, is actually is a simple material system, but the provides contains so many OH group, the mm -hmm. hydrogen bond just is so strong. Yes, you're <laughs> so, right. Yeah, this is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks for, for this addition. That's exactly the point I wanted. I, I forgot to mention, yes, yeah, yeah. PVA, because of this simple uh, structure and also this uh, rich uh, OH group compared to other uh, polymers. So indeed it has uh, like a unique or higher uh, level of uh, uh, like hydrogen bound force compared to others. Yes, um, um, we, we tried some other polymers. They shows uh, a pretty good uh, mechanical property enhancement and everything, but maybe not to the same degree of uh, enhancement as shown by PVA. Yeah, so it also depends on the, the polymers. So as long as we are able to maintain this high uh, ag polymer aggregation, the degree of polymer aggregation, that the structure can be relatively more stable. Um, yeah, so the design, the key of the, to the design is to make sure you, you, you're able to design some uh, uh, chemical band, or like physical, uh, like a kind of a secondary or super molecular force there, which can be uh, more robust. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah, good, thank you. Thank you. Our next question is uh, Zheng Yi. Zheng Yi, yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, Professor. It's a great talk, and uh, it's, uh, I learned a lot. And uh, I have a very general question uh, regarding the sensing and activation of uh, hydrogels. Um, because we know that uh, hydrogel can be uh, responsible, uh, re re responsive to many uh, external stimuli like heat, temperature, uh, uh, temperature and pH, and also uh, other uh, stimuli. But was that also May, may also cause any problems on sensing and activation because uh, uh, in real life, we have a lot of stimuli that uh, happens at the same time. And uh, so, what, so is there any ways to decouple them or, or maybe actually make some hydrogels which can only uh, be responsive, responsive to one of the stimuli? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. That's indeed another challenge we're trying to tackle in our lab as well. Yes, uh, indeed. For example, uh, for the just 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 take take this uh, this uh, um, real as an example um, here. 
since we use a polynapam, which is thermal responsive, so right, it, uh, like uh, uh, we try to use a connectivity change to, to uh, monitor the string, monitor the strings. Well, at the same time, actually, if the local temperature change, this will cause uh, uh, the, uh, the the signal change as well, right? So this is indeed what you described. Uh, this material may be responsive to multiple stimuli. So how do you know this is uh, monitoring the motion, right? Yeah. So indeed, we have a we have been trying to. Uh, two a couple of strategies. One, as you said, is to decouple them um, by uh, so we basically use a uh, like a, a kind of a, a data analysis method uh, to measure different uh, uh, properties where these two different properties reflect a different uh, uh, differently to temperature versus uh, motion. Yeah. So um, basically, it's almost like you have two variables. Now you have two equations. Um, you're able to to solve this, right? So that's uh, that's one way. And another way is to um, maybe put a, another layer or in different orientation or something to add some more uh, like a responsive material or or, or sensing uh, units there, so that uh, using slightly different materials or in or in different orientations, you add one more equation as well, right? So that you are able to decouple uh, this. Yeah, but that's indeed uh, the challenge for a lot of uh, uh, robotic sensing <laughs> development, where people always need to make sure we know which particular type of motion we're we're detecting, right? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Next question is uh, go to Wei uh, Yan. I think uh, you can. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sautin. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Ho, for your wonderful talk. So uh, I'm Wei Yan. I'm a postdoc at MIT with Professor Yufing. So uh, my research interest uh, is uh, fiber electronics, smart wearables, and uh, textiles. So I'm not in the field, but I'm very interested in this talk. So I have a question about uh, uh, regarding the. Uh, the scanning down of this uh, technology, because uh, you know, in many complex and uh, constrained environments, for example, uh, the gastro, uh, gastrointestinal system or the blood vessels of the human body, it requires very, very small robots or uh, actuators. So what are the challenges, uh, you know, to make these uh, robots uh, uh, actuators very small in order to perform local motion, bending, rotation, uh, drug delivery, even uh, surgeries. Uh, you know, all these function, functionalities have been mentioned in your uh, presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for this question. Uh, actually, we, we do have an expert uh, like Jen in here doing the micro robots right here. Um, actually, my answer to your question is, actually, in during the development of uh, gel-based uh, uh, soft robotic systems, um, we usually, tend to like uh, fabricate a very tiny samples. And so we usually have the opposite challenge where <laughs> like uh, it's harder to make a larger scale <laughs> robot um, because when we when you make a like say a large piece of gel, it sometimes if it's a osmotic pressure driven process, it takes a longer time. It sometimes can be minutes, hours or days to uh, uh, complete the, the the shrinkage or the motion right so um and yeah so that if if talking about hydrogel uh, we found it's uh, more challenging to make it a uh, uh, like a larger scale uh, and actually the the hydrogels i demonstrated in today's talk actually have been like always at a like a very small scale it can be like a, a sub millimeter or, or micron scale uh, so those are perfect for this type of material but if you are talking about like even say like a sub hundred micron or even small then indeed that will require some uh, like uh, other manufacturing techniques. Uh, for example, that's, uh, like, that's why we have been trying to develop a 3D printing techniques so that is compatible with hydrogels. So talking about that, we noticed that uh, in your lab, when we try to print like a really fine, like say like a maybe sub micron features with the 3D printing, it's uh, more challenging with hydrogel compared to other plastics. With other plastics, you can like a more simply just uh, uh, achieve the, 
the nice finality of uh, the printed feature versus your design. Uh, where, whereas if you, you try to print the same structure with hydrogel, because of the swelling or because of the softness of the hydrogel, it's usually the printed structure doesn't really represent this uh, sharp, neat uh, design. Uh, so the feature become a, like a, the, the, the dimension, the, the feature size become a lot bigger and the, uh, the contour, everything become like a, like a distort. Yeah, so those are the, uh, indeed the challenge in uh, fabricating like a, uh, like say uh, sub micron features. Uh, therefore, we are also trying to improve or solve this issue by uh, improving the, uh, the 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 printing uh, like ink, and also this uh, printing uh, procedure. So recently, we have got some uh, promising uh, results that shows a uh, uh, much higher resolution uh, while having this uh, high toughness so that hopefully we're able to make a really like a I would say sub micron or even 100 nanometer uh, printing resolution which uh, were not achieved uh, before with hydrogels uh, like conventional hydrogel printing process so hopefully that can help mini miniaturizing uh, the gel based uh, robotics so that you can have a really delicate intricate uh, like a uh, uh, design while having the desirable um, uh, functions, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I, thank you. I was also really impressed by this uh, sub 100 nanometer or 10 nanometer resolution. I look forward to your this coming paper. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully it's coming out soon. Yeah, uh, it's maybe it's not sub nano. It's a sub ten nano. It's like a uh, definitely. Uh, yeah. So for 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 basic demonstration, we have seen uh, like a really uh, 100 nano. Uh, yeah, 100 nano is already actually a great uh, revolutionary achievement as far as I know. Sometimes yeah. even 10, 10 nano level. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, that, that's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> but when the paper is published, you really look forward to it. I read it you know, in detail. You, you won't be very surprised when you see how we make it. <laughs> Just a little heads yeah. up there. <laughs> yeah, that, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I, I have questions. question. I think no one has questions. So I have chances to ask question <laughs> as the host. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I'm pretty interested about this energy conversion, that part. I'm really interested about this concept. So mm -hmm. we basically actually harvest energy from uh, light, right? Mm -hmm. Then the light eventually convert to heat, so thermal energy. Mm -hmm. and ultimately, it will convert to mechanical energy. So my question is, uh, what's the uh, rough uh, energy conversion efficiency currently? And uh, what can be the way to improve this efficiency? That's a great question. That's actually yeah. something we are not very, very good at. Uh, we try to estimate the energy conversion. Um, well, our, our focus in that work was to try to achieve, realize the concept without uh, really carefully calculating or uh, optimizing the energy conversion efficiency. Uh, we know the um, um, the photo to thermal conversion, that part of the conversion efficiency is uh, fairly high. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, that part should be hot. Yeah, yeah, especially locally. And uh, but overall, this uh, photothermal mechanical, uh, this whole energy conversion process uh, is not very, very, very high uh, efficiency. Yeah, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of energy loss that would have to have right. So we we, we need to allow uh, the thermal energy dissipation in order yeah, for yeah. the gel to recover. You know, so um, here we 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 basically just uh, neglect <laughs> the efficiency part. Uh, yeah, so then the way actually indeed for some uh, part of the motion where like for example, you try to trigger the motion for this, uh, this uh, part of the, the, the process, we need to ensure high efficiency so that you don't require very high light intensity because originally we realized everything in lab with a strong laser, but when we try to uh, realize the same thing under sunlight, which is a lot weaker than the laser, it didn't work initially. And then in, for that part, we try to uh, uh, further improve the energy uh, conversion efficiency by basically introducing higher uh, photothermal conversion efficiency 
absorbers, uh, there are so many like uh, like super black materials or nanoparticles uh, or like a nano uh, porous carbon fibers uh, that people have reported so that we just simply incorporate those <laughs> uh, nano components into our gel. So that can uh, pretty effectively improve the photothermal part. And then for the thermal uh, to mechanical part, we basically just uh, tailor the hydrogels uh, uh, structures and uh, uh, diffusivity, the porosity, everything, so that to make sure the gel can easily contract, I mean, the network can easily contract um, to more efficiently harness the, the thermal energy. So these are just uh, some like a very preliminary efforts we put in to achieve, like say the sunlight uh, driven motions. Yeah, so we, that that's where we have a, a try, like a kind of a level of effort we have put in uh, without even further. I think definitely that's very very important because uh, you would you you would want to uh, uh, realize uh, um, this uh, different kind of functions at a lowest energy input as possible, right? So um, yeah, that's definitely uh, another like a small gap that we didn't cover yet. Yeah. Thank you. This is really actually uh, really I think something. Uh, concept is uh, people are not fully solved yet, but this opportunity in the field, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, we probably let's have the last question uh, for today's talk. So our last question goes to Professor Chen Zhang. Uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Satya. Um, uh, yeah, thank you, Simi. Very nice talk. Um, so actually, I have two questions. <laughs> and um, like, uh, uh, one is uh, like uh, maybe very uh, like a uh, quick is um, that uh, you show very nice structure and um, for, for different uh, inspiration. We know that for many biological structures, they kind of have, a, uh, so, the, so they have a gradient. Like if, if they want to integrate the bone and the tendon, so at the interface, they may have some special microstructure. Mm -hmm. Like uh, your manufacturing method, can you like uh, uh, design some gradient structure when you want uh, to connect a soft and hard material? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would say we we have we haven't really tried to create create such a like a uh, gradients in 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 like in one material in terms of the stiffness, right? You were talking about stiffness, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, we haven't really tried, but uh, uh, that's definitely possible um so because uh, for example for for the stiffness tuning method um is truly just uh, coming from this uh, uh this a uh, half master effect for example right and then this uh, uh material uh, uh stiffness uh can be tuned by uh the different type of ions and different uh, soaking time as well right so uh therefore by using uh like uh, controlling the diffusion uh, uh, of the the ions across this uh, the the depth of the material, for example, you should be able to tune the uh, the the stiffness of, or the modulus of the material, right? So because you have a and 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 this is this shows like this forty eight hours a period a duration, you can actually. Uh, tailor or play with the uh, the type of ions and the concentration of the ions so that you are able to tailor the uh, this uh, period of time so so that eventually you are able to control the gradient formation right so if you are able to find that a uh, sweet spot um, with the uh, several knobs like uh, the type of ions concentration and uh, um, the yeah so the the time time frame uh, you should be able to create a gradients. Yeah, so, so we actually, in some of our experiments, we, we did observe a little bit of gradient, which we didn't try to make. Um, but uh, I think uh, um, for some, uh, uh, yeah, indeed, for from the bone to the soft tissue, um, if you try to achieve that, I think this, uh, this uh, uh, basic method uh, have the ability to achieve that. Okay, so I think I ask another question. <laughs> Sure, no problem. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, my, my question is also general and uh, also like I want to uh, ask uh, your suggestion for, for different, for people from different uh, background. Mm -hmm. So you seek uh, uh, inspiration from like uh, animal, plant and organ. Mm -hmm. I think how do you think uh, they are uh, like a similarity and the difference? 
for me, I think many people, uh, so at least um, my, my experience that uh, uh, people talk about uh, animal and uh, this uh, uh, like uh, more than plant. So usually it's sunflower inspired thing. So how do you think uh, like um, in the next five to 10 years and uh, what are the interesting topic directly you wanted to study or suggest other people to do? <laughs> Thank you. Mm, thank you. So basically, you're asking what what kind of uh, inspirations we can further obtain from nature to inspire, uh, like our research material development. Um, actually, you know how we got inspirations from uh, different kind of uh, species or creations uh, usually are driven by the uh, actual problems. Um, we um, usually we wouldn't just start looking at something and then think, oh, we, we, we try to replicate it or, or something. We always uh, are like uh, driven by the, uh, the kind of the limitations or challenges in a lot of uh, uh, real life applications uh, for us to go back to think, to check what kind of, uh, um, you know, gaps or difference between the current materials versus the natural materials. And then from there, we of course need to know the field very well to see, you know, what are what what features have been achieved, um, so that what re remaining features have not uh, com by comparing the natural versus the man-made materials. And from there, uh, we were able to identify the the remaining uh, like missing features or missing functions. Then we try to. Uh, engineer the material or design the, the, the material to realize either the structure or the property or those uh, kind of uh, intelligence or the functions, right? So that's basically the kind of a process of um, uh, like a guiding our bio-inspired uh, material development. Yeah, so, um, and then if talking about what uh, what are the, the future directions of a bio-inspired materials, it's really hard to kind of uh, summarize um, because uh, truly nature is so, the more we, 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 we like uh, study materials, we, we develop materials, the more we feel so humbled by, you know, the amazing, fascinating, um, like uh, uh, evolution or features in, in, in biomaterials. So, um, the more we find uh, we can learn from nature. Yeah, um, so we, we're still so far from, from, uh, from the real human body, uh, from the sensitivity, from the, uh, you know, the, the um, how flexible, how, you know, um, elegant we're able to uh, move, to respond, right? So I would say almost any aspects can be uh, further inspired by nature's. Yeah, I don't know if this answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tom. Thank you, thank you, Shimi. Uh, I think we have last question. This uh, should be the last question because of the time. So the last question is from uh, Gang Ge. I think he put a question in the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, I, uh, you can ask a question uh, directly in person. I okay, so I'm trying to read this quickly. So hydrogels are sure. thick with so many water, 3D networks may heavily reduce the uh, aggregation efficiency. Secondly, hydrogel exhibiting desirable flexibility usually show high concentration density, which may reduce the transmission uh, tra transmission of activation energy. So to embed responsive nanoparticles in network is promising, but it's difficult to avoid aggregation for real dispersion. Wondering to prepare soft robotics by employing hydrogels is practical and what other eff effective uh, uh, strategies can be brought out. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so basically, um, Gang Ge here uh, pointed out several like uh, challenges or unique features of hydrogels um, that may pose the challenges uh, in the development of soft robotics based on gels, uh, like for example, the you know the large water water content, uh, the 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 high crossing density, uh, and the um, the third one is uh, uh, the 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 dispersion issue of uh, nanoparticles inside. 
Um, yeah, I think actually some of our work has already shown how we can avoid or overcome these issues. For example, um, as we just discussed, like uh, for example, the, the point related to crossing density, we didn't simply uh, like increase the crossing link density to uh, to 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 make to achieve this uh, high actuations, right? So uh, we basically just uh, try to uh, more focus on manipulating the the molecular level or nano level features so that we can still maintain this uh, uh, like a large pores and a continuous uh, network for fluid transport, right? So that wouldn't really uh, like uh, compromise the diffu diffusivity so that the actuation energy transmission can be still very well maintained, right? So actually I didn't get a chance to show another work uh, following the sorting, the sorting out. Uh, where instead of using ions, we use a secondary solvent, a so solvent, and that solvent can kind of serve as uh, uh, the, the the function of the sod, uh, which can also help um, with the, the polymer chain aggregation, uh, so that we can maintain and create really nice interconnected uh, power uh, network, uh, so that uh, uh, we saw like uh, about, I forgot how many times of the uh, enhancement of in diffusion. So for that, that really make the activation a lot faster while uh, even further improving the modulus at the same time, right? So basically, I'm trying to use this couple of examples to show that um, you know how we're able to kind of uh, uh, structure the gel by using different kind of uh, modification in the synthesis process to um, simultaneously uh, like uh, maintaining or improving both the diffusion and mechanical properties, right? Um, and uh, 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 in terms of uh, incorporating nanoparticles, yes, yeah, sometimes we, we we have to really you know try to ensure the nanoparticles are well dispersed. You know, uh, usually that can be well dispersed, but still um, you need some careful uh, print, uh, like a process. So uh, we like uh, therefore we we try to like sometimes we can introduce maybe other non nanoparticle type of uh, add additives. Uh, like polymers, or maybe by simply functionalizing this uh, uh, the the prime primary polymer network to endow this function the material with such a functions without incorporating additional additive uh, uh, nanoparticles, right? So uh, these are just a several uh, like uh, exemplary strategies we have been using to overcome this uh, um, challenges. And uh, you were asking about you know what are the alternative or effective uh, strategies. Um, actually, a lot of uh, the features I showed here can be probably realized by other responsive uh, materials as well, uh, especially for those kind of like uh, um, <coughs> autonomous motions. So uh, I didn't uh, get a chance to show much uh, with this kind of functions with other materials. But uh, for example, another very uh, attractive material is uh, liquid crystal elastomer, right? So a lot of researchers have been using those different type of smart polymers. <coughs> other than gels. So um, for example, liquid crystal elastomers has a lot of uh, uh, advantages uh, or unique features. For example, it doesn't rely on water um, environment. So you can uh, basically replicate the similar functions in liquid crystal elastomers for them to operate in air. Right, that's one one thing, and another thing is uh, uh, the the responsiveness or response rate is a lot higher, so uh, it's it can move a lot faster. For some of our demonstration, for um, like a comparing hydrogels versus a uh, uh, liquid crystal elastomers, uh, the response time can be like a, maybe ten seconds versus uh, maybe point some second, right? So okay. It is a lot faster. Where you can you can you have a like a, a shape memory a shape memory polymers where you are able oh. to lock and reprogram, right? So there are so many yeah. alternative materials as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, may I have another question, please? Yeah, professor. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you see, uh, I am wondering uh, how about uh, to to realize element uh, or. Or, or you say reconfer, uh, reconfer, reconfiguration of nanoparticles uh, under under external fields in the, such as external uh, such as electrical uh, fields and or three D printing uh, to realize elements of nanoparticles within the 
uh, networks to enhance uh, the actuation uh, efficiency. Yeah. So one one thing I didn't quite catch. You're saying trying to use electrical or magnetic uh, to, to how. Uh, how about uh, uh, to realize uh, element of nanoparticles within uh, you see within the net networks under electrical uh, fields under external electrical fields uh, you mean to to the enhance the yeah elements of uh, of uh, nanoparticles yeah 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 realize elements you mean uh, you mean how to add or like a Mm -hmm. yeah, just a rearrangement. Yeah. Or arrangement, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. Mm. Uh, mm, yeah, so for our current dem currently demonstrated materials, we so far we didn't really have the need to really specially arrange the those additive oh. particles, but indeed uh, people have been trying to use electrical uh, field or magnetic field to generate either gradients or alignment uh, of those uh, uh, particles inside of a polymer network, because uh, usually the gels fabrication process is just a solution based, right? So you, oh, yes. yeah, you mix those particles in the solution and then during the curing process, um, you, can, you can use electrical or magnetic field to align your structures or create uh, create uh, gradients. And another way is to use uh, maybe 3D printing a method uh, where the if you use the extrusion base, you can really align the uh, embedded nano rods if they're an isotropic uh, uh, like nanomaterials uh, to form this uh, really nice desirable alignment uh, of those nano components inside of gel in addition to the fields you mentioned, right? So uh, those are uh, all possible. Right, but you just need to carefully design the process so that the solidification, the, the, the kinetics can match your uh, alignment process, right? So as long as you can achieve that, uh, those alignments shouldn't be issue, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your nice talk. Okay, thanks. Thank you. thank you. Thank you, Shimi. Thank you all the attendees and the panelists. I have to end today's talk. Is uh is so so wonderful and uh, if we have more questions, I think uh, definitely you can either check the uh, video. Uh, I think it will be uploaded on uh, YouTube soon, or you can I think you can also directly contact the professor via yes. uh, oh. email, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think today's talk is truly inspiring. I, I personally, I, I I'm also in the software material field, right? Why me? I'm in the field. I'm still learning a lot. Thank oh, you. Thank no, you for the wonderful talk. I really enjoyed the discussion and, and this platform really brought a, a really great audience here asking all sorts of a great questions, yeah. including our panelists. So I really enjoyed this a whole process and thank you for having me. And as uh, Shouting mentioned, I can always be reached out by emails or anytime, please. Yeah, uh, uh, Yin Zhen, uh, yeah. Do, do you want to add us something or yeah. wait and end this? Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh... Uh, Professor Her is really inspiring talk, and uh, we're gonna upload your record to the to YouTube and BDBDs in case anyone uh, missed the missed the talk, especially for people back in uh, Asia. Um, so just like a trailer for the our next talk will be given by uh, Professor uh, Guo Jingchen, uh, who will share his research on um, using uh, uh, biomaterials for drug delivery and uh, precision medicine and uh, hope to see you next time yeah thanks everyone yeah thank you everyone thank you bye yeah bye